Mr. Chairman, Minister, Commissioner, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is a great pleasure and a privilege uh, for me on behalf of the International European Movement to uh, address you this morning. I want to say in particular to all of the uh, delegates who are attending this Congress from the uh, civil society organisations how extremely pleased we are that you have taken the time to be here today and we look forward to the deliberations today and tomorrow uh, with you. Uh, I want uh, to thank all of those who have assisted us and who have been our sponsors but most especially Professor to you and through you I would like to say uh, how grateful we are to TUSEF. You have been our indispensable partner in terms of uh, putting uh, this uh, Congress together and we thank you and of course our hosts here this morning for uh, all of your uh, efforts on our behalf. Uh, the last speech which we heard uh, which touched on all of the big issues to do with uh, our engagement and our partnership together is one whose values I subscribe to and so you will forgive me if I don't repeat it because I believe it. I want if I could to bring my attention and therefore your attention to what has brought us here in respect of the role of civil society and to say first of all how wonderful it is to see the diversity of who is here. There's a diversity by nation and there's a diversity by uh, specialism. As I looked at the list of uh, attendees, we have civil society organisations that touch on culture, migration, transparency, trade unions, employers groups, women's rights, disability, minority rights, sustainable development, natural habitats, environmental protection, youth, health, students, poverty, refugees. It's truly a very large and wide scope and of course tells us straight away how extensive uh, is the engagement across such a wide range of sectors of organisations of civil society. And you have different missions and roles, research, adv advocacy, partnership, networking, service provision, or some or all of those things in the menu of your activities. The civil society developments in this region in general, and in Turkey in particular, have been most impressive. Uh, it is true that their awakening did not require the arrival of Turkey's recognition as candidate state in 1999. But there is absolutely no doubt that since that time there has been a deepening and an intensification of the uh, emergence and development of civil society and uh, none more impressively uh, than here in Turkey itself. I had the great pleasure some months ago to be invited by Ambassador Boskir and by Minister Baish and their colleagues to attend a seminar for journalists in Antalya. And at that seminar we had various discussions uh, with uh, various groups from civil society. And in one of those discussions, and this was in front of journalists, in front of the minister, in front of the system, we had a very open discussion about a group who had organized doctors over many years to report on cases of uh, torture and uh, degrading treatment of prisoners. And at the beginning, this was a rough experience. The people who did it themselves risked to be the next one in line uh, to, for a visit by the forces of law and order. And what I found fascinating that we had this open discussion that many people outside Turkey haven't heard and don't believe can happen. Ten years ago I think such a discussion with such openness would have been impossible. Possibly even five years ago, I don't know. 
But I, I left there filled through that example with a sense of the powerful possibilities of a system which is willing to open its heart and its mind to its own society and citizens, especially through actors in civil society. And these are the kinds of stories that Turkey needs to tell. The practical detail of the living reality of this catalyzer, which has been Turkey's European uh, experience. But most of all, a story to tell not about Turkey and Europe, but about Turkey and its own modernization. And it is a powerful and positive story. I thought I should say that because it brings me to a larger point. One of the great founding fathers of the United States and of, uh, of that uh, great republic and its traditions, and one of the great authors of its foundation documents was Thomas Jefferson, who became the third president of the United States. And he passed many remarks that are worth quoting. But one of my favorites was in correspondence. It's not in the Bill of Rights, and it's not in the US Constitution. And the phrase is that for government to work, it needs the consent of the governed. For government to work, it needs the consent of the governed. And I would say in a modern democracy, with all of its complexity in policy making and delivery, for good government and good governance to work, it needs not just the consent, but it needs the engagement and participation of its citizens and their organizations. And we can see this, of course, the truest meaning is borne out. We saw it in Central Eastern Europe in the series of revolutions or evolutions of 1989. We see it now with the Jasmine Revolution in Tunisia and the implications in Tahrir Square in Cairo, uh, Yemen, Jordan and so on across the region. And here again, permit me to make a brief observation about Turkey. Uh, you've remarked, Professor, in your opening remark that one of the things you've learned to do well in Turkey is the transition of power by democratic means. You've also developed your market economy, you've set out to develop good neighbourly relations and generally to seek to be a positive uh, player in your wider region. And in these terms, Turkey is very important for Europe's own strategic political needs. And looking at what's happening in the wider region, you are an anchor of stability and a modernizer that stands as a, a beacon of sorts. And the European Union has need of that capacity as it contemplates its dialogue following the Jasmine Re Revolution. We're here developing a theme that we started in Ljubljana. We had a Congress in Ljubljana in April 2009. And the Congress was then with civil society, mostly from the states of uh, Western Balkans. We follow up today, and what I want to do is simply to recall our conclusions from Ljubljana, which are the starting point for us of this uh, Congress. We had lots of discussions and we distilled our wisdom down to four key points. And we call the four key points the four S's. S number one, strategy. Our call in Ljubljana between civil society and government, national, regional and municipal, is that each government department, as part of its mandate, should consider the development of an enabling strategy for the engagement with civil society. How do you open the door and keep it open? Rather than close the door and say, we're running the shop and the others really don't matter. Because the whole thing in civil society, it's not a process, a movement or an engagement which seeks to replace or to displace representative democracy. On the contrary, it seeks to inform, to engage, and to enrich. And if you wish to inform, engage, and enrich, 
the door has to be open. So S number one, the strategy of opening the door, of finding within systems the willingness and the capacity and the determination to enable civil society to engage. S number two is to do with structure. Political will is an essential. Goodwill is an essential, but it's not enough. You need, along with this, support. You need practical support. Frequently, startup support is indispensable, and it means a financial contribution. But it also means in structures that civil society need to develop structures which are capable also of being autonomous, not in the pocket of the sponsor, or not only always taking money from the same sponsor. So in other words, the beginning, the catalytic effect of the original donation is important, but civil society too needs to grow up, to network harder, to develop more sources of finance, and to build its own capacity. Because the more capacity you build, with multiple sources of finance, the more independent and autonomous you can be as an actor. And autonomy and independence matter to the integrity and to the public purpose of civil society. So we need these structures, both in government and in civil society, to develop and to mature over time. The third S that we looked at was sustainability. The direct and the indirect support mechanisms, the open door policy of which I've spoken, the start-up grants or uh, ongoing grants uh, of, of which I have uh, spoken. But let me add on sustainability something extremely important from our point of view in European movement and from the point of view of best practice and guidelines internationally. The support that's given should be given transparently and the, the support that's given should not be with political strings attached. There has got to be an integrity and independence and autonomy. It's not that civil society is the arm's length agent of the Department of State or of a minister or ministry or political party. And in this sense, on the structure side, the sustainability requires transparency as an essential part of its design and delivery in order to assure autonomy and independence. And the fourth and final S that we examined was the question of standards. And by that I mean in particular public sector reform towards open access to documents, freedom of information and public accountability. Also accountability by civil society for its use of public funds. Accountability is a two-way street and not merely a one-way street and transparency is a two-way street and not a one-way street from authority to civil society but equally civil society with itself. The rule of law, and it has been mentioned here this morning, matters because the rule of law should confer on you the right to know, should confer on you the freedom of expression, and should confer on you, in terms of these basic fundamental rights, the right to engage without fear or prejudice in terms of advancing the work that you have committed to. There are excellent guidelines through European Union and through OECD and our four S's, the strategy, structures, sustainability and standards were derived from them as well as from our discussions. Permit me just in finishing to thank uh, the staff in European Movement International together with uh, TUSEV and uh, the University for the wonderful organisation, which I appreciate. Permit me to thank the Secretariat for EU Affairs here, which has always been a, a keen partner, and we thank you for this, and for the Representative Office of European uh, Union, 
and for the Commissioner and his staff uh, for their constant uh, engagement, which we greatly appreciate ourselves as an agent of civil society. I want to thank the Rector and staff of uh, Bilgi University. We appreciate your facilities here today. To thank TOG uh, for their sponsorship and uh, EFES, whose uh, products we will enjoy at a reception later tonight. And again, uh, finally, as I began, to thank TUSEV, the Third Sector Foundation uh, here in Turkey. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the Congress. I look forward to a brief concluding remark at the end of the work tomorrow. And I look forward, in particular for those from civil society, that we will build our networking with each other so that we can be part of the chemistry of consent. The first speech we heard about was about the big issues. But the big issues need catalyzers, and the big issues need the chemistry of consent, and civil society can be part of that. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick.